Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Monday, Thursday service at Orange Beach United Methodist Church. My name is Jim. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's great to have you with us this evening for this service. Now, as you can tell, we are not at our church, but rather we are gathered around my dining room table. And I want to invite you to do just that, to gather your family around your dining room table. And if you wish to participate in communion tonight, to gather some form of bread, a, a piece of bread, uh, crackers, a uh, tortilla, anything like that. Get some juice, whatever you would like, and enough cups for everyone around the table. Now, as you're gathering those elements, let me remind you about our Easter drive-in worship service. We'll be having that service at the Orange Beach Sportsplex Park at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. It's going to be a great celebration as we get to gather together as long as we stay in our cars. So that's that's kind of the secret. We have to stay in our cars. Um, they will not allow golf carts or bicycles or motorcycles there. We must all be in enclosed vehicles. But there, if we just tune our radios to 89.3, we'll all be worshiping together at the Orange Beach Sportsplex Park at 10 a.m. on Easter morning. Now, for those who are not comfortable getting out, we'll still be broadcasting our services online on our Facebook page and with our YouTube channel. So either way, it's going to be a great day celebrating Easter together. But tonight, we want to prepare to commemorate Monday, Thursday, and to share the Lord's Supper together. So let's take just a brief moment and gather those elements together. Well, now that we're all gathered around the table, let me remind you what Monday, Thursday is really all about. It's the day in the middle of Holy Week that everything seems to change. Um, we go from celebrating Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, a high and holy day, lots of praise, lots of celebration, to Monday, Thursday, when Jesus will be uh, betrayed and arrested. It's a, well, it's a difficult kind of day. To celebrate. In fact, we wouldn't call it a celebration. We would call it a commemoration. We're remembering this day. We're remembering the day that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and that he was betrayed and arrested. And as we gather together, typically on a Monday, Thursday service, it's a more solemn, somber kind of service as we look deep inside ourselves to think about, quite possibly, the ways that we've betrayed Jesus, to think about how we need Jesus in our lives. And so you normally leave the Monday, Thursday service in a in a more quiet, somber, reflective tone. Now, I'm just guessing that's not the feel you have around your table right now. I know that's not typically the feel we have around our dinner table, especially when you have young kids at home. I mean, normally if you have kids at home, it's chaotic, it's loud, and it's crazy. And you know, I think that that's the way it was with Jesus and his disciples on the night that he celebrated for the very first time, what we would call the Lord's Supper. Now, just to set the scene for you, remember that the disciples were gathering in, in this upper room to celebrate the Passover meal with Jesus. And Jesus was excited about it. He was looking forward to celebrating the Passover with his disciples. Now, the Passover is a Jewish holiday. It is a festival that celebrates the time when the children of Israel were enslaved and they were set free and they were led by Moses through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, and then eventually towards and into the promised land. Joshua would take them into the promised land, the land that God had promised to them. And so it really is a holiday that celebrates the people of God being set free. And you see, for the disciples, they were all about freedom because they didn't feel free. They felt the pressure of the Roman oppression because the Romans actually controlled the whole area. They were the superpower of the day. Not only that, but the religious system had become so corrupt that they did not feel like there was any justice, even in the religious system of the day. Then comes along this young uh, rabbi named Jesus, and he has a new message, and he is magnetic. And they are drawn to him and they follow him and they see the miracles that he's performing. And they think he indeed is the one who's going to change everything. He's going to lead to reform in the religious system of the day. And he will ultimately lead into getting rid of the Roman rule and the Roman government to where the people of Israel will once again finally be, be free. 
And, and on this week, this week that we call Holy Week, when Jesus enters the city, the shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here comes the son of David. Here comes our next king, right? Um, to Monday when he clears the temple. He goes in and the money changers are, are there in the temple courtyard. He turns their tables over and he says, you guys, you have, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so the reform is already starting. And then when the religious leaders question Jesus, trying to trap him, Jesus bests them all the time. All the time, Jesus comes out on top. And so this has just been an incredible week for the disciples. They are riding a high. And I can imagine that they're thinking, man, Jesus is going to make a big announcement. He's going to make a big announcement at the Passover festival. And we are ready for it. We are ready for Jesus to make this announcement. And we are ready to take the next step into this revolution. Well, when they get to that upper room to celebrate the Passover with Jesus, they walk in the door with this sense of Jesus is going to lead us into victory. And there they find Jesus on one knee, towel wrapped around his waist, washing the people's feet as they come in the room. Now, in their mind, that's not the role of a leader. That's the role of a servant. They would later find out that really, that's what real leaders do is they serve others. And see, in their mind, they're thinking control, they're thinking power, they're thinking defeat the enemy of Rome and the corrupt religious system of the day. Jesus had an entirely different kingdom in mind. So uh, they allowed Jesus to wash their feet, and in their confusion, uh, they they kind of worked through that. This isn't the first time Jesus would confuse them with something, and normally they would just go along. They may ask him, Jesus, what was that all about? And they may ask him later, but, you know, it's Passover. Let's get to the feast, and, and quite a feast it was. You know, the Passover celebration, there were a number of rituals that they went through during the celebration. It's actually called a Seder meal, and it's a very specific type of meal that the uh, Hebrew people uh, celebrate. And, and I'd encourage you to Google it, and you can see all the steps in the meal and how meaningful every step was. For instance, there would be part in the meal where they would eat a bitter herb, maybe like parsley. If you've never just eaten raw parsley, you'll know that it's bitter. It's not tasty. You, you wouldn't just eat it just for fun. But they did, not for fun, but to remind them of the bitterness of being enslaved. And then as they feast it, the good food reminded them of the joy of being set free and, and living in harmony with God and harmony with others. So each stage of the meal had a special meaning to it. And the food had a very special meaning to it. Every, every type of food was meaningful in that celebration. Uh, much like when we think about Thanksgiving. What's Thanksgiving without a turkey or a birthday celebration without cake um, or uh, 4th of July without barbecue? Each Part of the meal, though, was even more specifically related to what God was doing and what God had done. And they believed how God was going to lead them in the future. So they're, they're having this meal, and I could just imagine the conversation about uh, the new kingdom, about what God was doing through Jesus, and about how this week had gone, how Jesus is just, just uh, popularity just growing and growing and growing. It's kind of like he's conquering all these people, and these people are just coming over to his side. Well, towards the end of the meal, we're told that Jesus took some bread. And interestingly enough, he took bread and he probably called all of his disciples together. And, and he took that bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks to God for the bread that was before him. And then, and then he broke it. And he, and he said to his disciples, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, now, once again, I'm sure his disciples were all confused and discombobulated once again about what is going on. What does this really mean? This is your body um, given to us. What, what, what is that all about? But then Jesus does something even a little more strange, at least in my opinion. He takes some wine and pours it in a cup. And he takes that cup and he gives thanks to God for the cup. And then he, he passes it out to his disciples. But before he does that, he says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, there's some really key words in that phrase. First word is covenant. Now, covenant is all about a relationship. It's about how two people relate together. 
A marriage is one type of covenant. But Jesus mentioned here, this is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is a blood covenant. This is a permanent covenant. And then he said, it's going to be poured out for you. In other words, my blood is going to be poured. In other words, I'm going to die for this covenant, for this new way of relating that you and I will relate and we know that we will ultimately relate with, uh, with to God through this new covenant. So the disciples passed the cup around and they all drank some and, and I'm sure they were all a little bewildered. You know, they were probably still waiting for the announcement. And here, once again, Jesus is talking about his death. He had a habit of doing that. I mean, he told the disciples over and over again that this was coming. But again, they just didn't get it. They sang a hymn, probably out of the book of Psalms, and then they, they went out to the Mount of Olives to pray. On the way, the disciples began to argue, which they typically did, about who was the greatest. Who would be the second in command in this new kingdom that Jesus was leading us to? Jesus would hear of it, and he would stomp them, and he would let them know that's not the way his kingdom is organized. In fact, um, he would say to all of them, you will all betray me before this night is over. Peter said, not me, buddy. I won't. I'll be with you to death. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll deny me three times. Well, Peter was taken aback, as well as all the other disciples. And they quietly went to the Mount of Olives with Jesus to pray. Now, it's really late. And when they get there, Jesus separates them into two groups, taking Peter, James, and John with him a little further into the grove. He tells them to stay there and pray. Then Jesus proceeds on further into the grove and he prays. They fought sleep. They fought it hard, but they were tired. They had just eaten a big meal and, and they were tired. But yet they were startled out of their sleep when Judas arrived. He was flanked by Roman soldiers and temple guards. And he walked right up to Jesus and he kissed him. At that, the soldiers grabbed Jesus and in that moment, Everything went nuts. Everything went crazy. Peter grabs a sword, cuts off a guy's ear. Jesus yells at Peter, put away your sword. That's not the way. Um, Jesus would ultimately heal the man whose ear was cut off. And disciples were, they didn't know what to think. I mean, who would know what to think? Totally discombobulated. And in that moment, they ran. They were afraid for their very lives. They were afraid that the soldiers would take them. And so they ran and hid. Some followed Jesus from a distance, hiding in the shadows. But they definitely were not public figures that day. Now, Jesus would be arrested that night, led away in chains, taken before a magistrate, thrown into jail, taken again in the morning, Friday morning, before another magistrate. There he would be pronounced guilty, Charged, pronounced guilty, his sentence was execution. Crucify, crucify, they yelled. And so the process began. He was drugged through the streets, mocked, spit upon, struck, beaten. Crown of thorns was placed on his head and ultimately he would be led to the cross where he would be executed. The disciples, again, some watching from a distance, some hiding, all in fear. And when Jesus died that Friday, well, their whole world stopped. All their hopes and dreams were gone. Chaos and confusion ensued. And grief began to bury their souls. So as oftentimes when people are grieving, they just want somebody near them. And the disciples gathered together secretly in, in a home. We don't know who all ended up being there, but I, I imagine it was more than just the 11 disciples that were left. I imagine some of the women were there as well. Friday evening had to be a horrific evening. Saturday, as they began to wake for the new, the new day, imagine there wasn't much stirring among them, not much talking at all. Somebody probably said, I'm getting kind of hungry. Others thought, I can't eat. 
but it had been probably 36 hours before they, since they had eaten, since that last supper. In their grief and despair, food had lost its allure, and their bodies now was growing tired and, and hungry. Somebody said, well, we got to eat. We got to keep up our strength. Well, I don't feel like eating. Oh, you got to have something. We'll just simple meal, just, just some bread. Some bread and a little wine. Now, I imagine this, and I'm, I'm imagining all this, but, but probably somebody got out a, a big piece of bread and they broke it, and they gave thanks to God first for what they had, for that was their custom and tradition, and they broke the bread, and they passed it out to one another. As they began to eat the bread and drink the wine, I imagine something happened deep in their soul as... It's not only were they were they getting nutrition from the bread and the wine, but but something deep was happening in their soul. Some kind of spark was being ignited deep within. For in that moment, I think, and again, this is all conjecture, that that something was being triggered. And maybe they remembered some of the words of Jesus who said, I must go away so that the Comforter will come. Maybe they remember that night just 36 hours ago when Jesus said, this is my body given to you. And indeed, they watched Jesus' body being beaten and torn, given away. They watched his blood poured out. And remember, he said, this cup. And in that moment, I think maybe there was a spark that flamed in their soul. Now, again, that's all conjecture. We don't know. But what we do know is the next day, Easter Sunday morning, when Jesus arose from the grave, later that day, he would take a journey down a road called the Emmaus Road with two disciples. And and they were walking down this road in despair because Jesus had died. And when they finally arrived at their destination, the Bible says that Jesus Unbeknownst to them, they didn't recognize Jesus, but Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And in that moment, in that moment, there was something that blew across their soul. When they took the bread and they knew it was of the Lord, it energized them, it changed them, and they ran back to the disciples to share the good news. And I know for me, There have been times in my life when I have been confused and discombobulated, broken. And I've come before the Lord's table in a weakened state, trying to figure out life, trying to know if I matter, trying to know if if anyone even cared. And there to receive by the grace of God a piece of bread with the pronouncement, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And a cup of juice being reminded of this is the blood of Christ poured out for you. And and when I have received those elements, something stirred in my soul, something more than just a memory, something powerful and beautiful and awe-inspiring, and it it nourished me not only physically but spiritually to to get up and to move forward and to continue this journey of faith, to realize that I am not alone and that indeed Christ is in me through the power of his Holy Spirit. This evening as we gather around these tables, your dinner table, remind you that no matter where you are, the Lord is with you. He's there. He is He is present. And in your confusion and maybe despair and lots of questions and unknown and all the newness that's going on right now, and in your loneliness, as we have been ordered to stay in shelter, maybe tonight more than ever, you and I need to have that freshness of the Holy Spirit blow across our souls and ignite that flame of passion once again within us. And so with that sense, we come before the Lord. We come to his, his table. And we give thanks to the Lord 
for all that he has done and all that he is. And we remember right now the night in which Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread, gave thanks to God, and and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body given to you, given for you. Likewise, that same night, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God, was thankful for the cup that was before him, for the task that was before him, for the opportunity that was before him, thankful that he could stand in the gap for us. He passed that cup around to his disciples. He said, drink from it, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood, the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. And so tonight, we come before the Lord in the same manner. And we pray together. And would you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit upon these gifts that are before us. Make them indeed the body and the blood of Christ for us, that we may be the body of Christ poured out into this world. Through these gifts, Lord, make us one with each other, though we have been separated. Make us one with each other, one in Christ, one in unity, one in faith, one together until all the world may come to know the truth of who you are and walk in your way that leads to life and live joyfully in your kingdom. We pray this today in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now in your families, wherever you are, I want to invite you to take that bread, to break it as we have already given thanks for it, and now to pass that out to each person sitting at your table. And then, as you receive the bread, feel free to go ahead and to consume that, to take in the body of Christ that was given to you. And now, as we share the cup, we uh, ask that you prepare a cup for each individual person at your table. And we lift the cup and we are reminded that this is the cup that represents the new covenant in Christ Jesus' blood poured out for all of us for the forgiveness of sin. Now take and drink from the cup. So in these, your mighty acts, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. And we pray that you would be inspired by all that God is doing in you. And that you would allow the Holy Spirit to use these elements today to spark that flame deep within your soul. And to send you forth into this world in the name of Christ. Now, at the end of our video together, you will see a couple links to a few worship songs that we want to invite you to take part of and to enjoy with your family as we continue to remember Monday, Thursday, that leads to Good Friday when Jesus was crucified, that ultimately lead to our resurrection hope on Easter Sunday morning when Jesus rises from the dead. God bless you, and we look forward to celebrating Easter with you this coming Sunday.